Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wednesday. Nobody make any loud noises. Nobody make any sudden movements. We don't know what might happen because Wednesdays used to be big news days. Now they're, I don't even know what they are anymore. JR, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> well, listen, there's no popcorn, there's no soda. There's no celebration. There's no watching with bated breath about what's going to happen yeah. any day anymore, especially on Wednesdays. Because I was just telling um, your producer Sophie that um, I'm not sure about the popcorn anymore. That was like <laughs> in, that was in the build up to this insanity. Jesus. Um, okay, so Jr. is alluding to the fact that his last appearance, last Big News Wednesday, was the day the Capitol was attacked. So um, I want to play a few seconds from the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Last week's Wednesday show, here it is. No Welcome everybody. You know how we always say that Wednesdays are big news Wednesdays? I think today is the day that proves that maxim because Jared Jackson joins us for the biggest news Wednesday ever. Uh, maybe it was JR, maybe it was, but I'm not glad the reasons mean, we thought. Yeah, I'm just glad you didn't include my response. Anyways. Um, <laughs> yeah, who, who would have known? I mean, it's kind of like a, a, a running joke that it's Big News Wednesday, but geez. Yeah. So obviously, and what's next Wednesday, John? Uh, inauguration. <laughs> um, and actually, that's when um, Baby gets put in the corner because Jenk <laughs> is going to be joining me and Jer is going to be doing the day after the inauguration, but it should be a Big News Day. But JR, I know that you're a little bit worried about the eating the popcorn on the day the Capitals attacked. What we didn't include in that video was the like 15 seconds before where I don't know if you remember this, but it was supposed to be the day that the election was certified and we were done with all this nonsense. So I started off the show by talking about how there's this feeling and I don't remember this good feeling. It's like flowers inside of me. It's like really? sunshine beaming on my face and the capital gets attacked. So <laughs> I don't think your popcorn is the worst thing. <laughs> anyway, hoping today will be better. Hopefully yeah. today will be better. Oh, we'll see. Now, we'll see. Everybody who's joined us here, it is a big news day. And we're gonna be talking a little bit impeachment about impeachment, which is ongoing uh, as we're filming this. I, I believe the actual impeachment vote will probably be after we're off the air. But if that is so, you can expect that uh, by the time the Young Turks rolls around, where I'll be joining Anna Kasparian, we'll be talking about it then. Um, but anyway, we've got a lot to talk about both that, a little bit more on last Wednesday's events. Um, let's see, we've got uh, updates on one of the legal circumstances that one of the, the capital attackers um, is now in uh, Trump losing one of his best friends, but who? Tune in to find out. And also an update on Flint, a little bit of progress, maybe moving towards a little bit of justice. But as we go along, please send us messages. You can send us tweets, comments on Twitch or on YouTube, super chat, stuff like that. We'll be responding as we go. I also wanted to remind you that um, coming up, Filming tomorrow will be the first ever extended Q&A session for our YouTube tier three members. There is a post on the community tab right now that you can go to to post questions. We're gonna be doing it live and so you can ask questions then too, but we wanna have some to start off with. So if you wanna go over to the community tab and ask questions, I will be engaging with those tomorrow during that. And with that said, JR, why don't we launch into the news? Let's do it. As we speak, they're debating impeaching Donald Trump for the, count them, two, second time. Historic, in one term. He couldn't put together one popular vote victory, <laughs> but two impeachments and much warranted. Is this the exact thing I'd want him impeached for? Well, certainly for this, but there's so many other things that he will never face impeachment charges for. But it is happening, it's not there yet, JR. They've cleared a couple of procedural hurdles. They're moving towards it. It is a slow process, but at some point today, he will be impeached for the second time. Yeah, and you know this is despite all of the pushback from Republicans like Joe Manchin and any other Republicans that are that are in the Senate that are saying this is not going to go anywhere. It was a waste of time. This is a hindrance on Biden's transition. I thought there's been. Plenty of things that have been hindering Biden's transition, um, namely the Trump administration. But anyways, um, despite all of these uh, all these scare tactics and hurdles that they're saying may hinder other things or even make this just like ill advised. Again, as Manchin said, we're still going to go forward, which I'm glad to hear. And 
I didn't know to the degree to which these elected officials, these lawmakers that were threatened last week um, would take it as far as going on to the next stage of these type of things. But it's looking like this is beginning to get some bipartisan uh, steam building, you know, mm-hmm. which actually will always surprise me. And I still don't believe it until I see a vote. Uh, that's a good point, which we haven't seen yet. A buildup of possible a couple of Republicans in the House, but maybe in the Senate too. We're going to be discussing that. Uh, in a little second, um, as we as we proceed, though, uh, let's see. I want to talk about what happened last night. So there was a effectively it was mostly a party line House vote to get uh, to get Pence to invoke the Twenty Fifth Amendment. Um, before the House passed that resolution, Pence sent a, sent a letter to Speaker Nancy Pelosi, making clear that he has no intention of doing it, claiming such a move would quote set a terrible precedent. So he's not going to do it, and he is blocking that. It could totally be done, he could try to do that. And so just bear that in mind as you're giving him all this credit for doing the right thing by not trying to overturn the election last Wednesday. Which again, I would love to point out, he couldn't have done no matter what he wanted to do. People are giving him credit for stuff that's just an 8chan fever dream. He couldn't overturn it. He could have like given a speech or something, he could have cried on the house floor. <laughs> he couldn't overturn the election. And as a general rule, don't give people credit for stuff they couldn't do anyway. Yeah, he, he had he had the nerve to stand up to Trump and tell him, I can't do that, Mr. President. Not I won't, not I refuse, mm-hmm. not this is madness. I can't do it. That has nothing to do with him. That's him stating yeah. what anyone else could have stated. You can't do it. All he said was I. Yeah. <laughs> Well, also, okay, well, if this is the standard, I would like to give credit to the Constitution because the Constitution also <laughs> told Trump that he couldn't do it. And I would argue the Constitution got in there first. It said it hundreds of years ago. <laughs> so I'm going to give the Constitution a bit more credit than Mike Pence. Also, Mike Pence says it would set a terrible precedent. How exactly would it set a terrible precedent? The idea that After you encourage a mob to kill you, Mike Pence, they wanted to kill you. And he was the one in the lead up to that saying, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm big friends with Mike Pence, but uh, if he doesn't do what he should do, then maybe I don't like him as much. And then they, they, a mob goes in there chanting, hang Mike Pence. It would set a terrible precedent to impeach him after that. That makes a ton of sense. That terrible precedent that it would set is holding elected officials accountable, specifically presidents accountable for their actions, their words, and inciting a riot, an insurrection, and an attempted coup in the Capitol building. That's what it would set a terrible precedent for. And why would it set that terrible precedent in his, in Mike Pence's opinion? Because it's a Republican president that would go down in history as the one that gets kicked out, or they have to invoke, invoke the 25th Amendment to get him out based off of what he did. So forever, what they're they're concerned about. Is the future name of the Republican Party. Not about what just happened, not about the future of the country, not about the legacy that this will leave. Because by the way, it will still go down in history that way because that's just the truth. But what they can't do is acknowledge it and allow that to actually happen because that would hurt their party. When he's long gone, he's concerned about his party more than he is concerned about the the, the survival of his country. Gotta be honest, they just yeah. don't care, even after all of it. He is a servant to the party. He actually doesn't care about the country. You know, I wish I could see like in in 50 years, 75 years, um, assuming I'm still alive that the Pop Tarts haven't caught up to me. And the world will either be one of two things. The way it's going, we're gonna be like scrounging through the countryside for the last bits of food. Or if you know we do what we need to do, I'll exist purely in the form of uh, uh, energy in some sort of galaxy spanning network. <laughs> um, but at that point, whichever it is, I will turn to the mutant child or I will you know, telepathically communicate with everyone simultaneously and say, what do you remember about that time when he was impeached twice and why it happened? It is gonna be fascinating to see what the media is saying about it, what academia is saying about it when we're removed by decades. But we're living in it right now and it is crazy. I almost swore there, it is crazy (laughs) either way. I can't swear here in the post apocalyptic hellscape. There I can swear on the the internet uh, data web. um, I don't know, I don't know what the rules will be. I'm really worried about tech CEOs though, but anyway. Crazy times. Yeah, this is what we have have to realize that I was just saying this uh, to my wife the other day that our kid is living through our kids are living through this historic time and they know it, but they kind of don't know it because 
that you have to have the gauge of the rest of history and other things that have happened. And you know how we had this insurrection in the Capitol building and how that just doesn't happen here. Uh-huh. Domestic insurrection in the Capitol building where the Confederate flag was waved around in the middle of, which is by the way, never happened. Like you would think, you know, if you want to go through some history books and be like, oh yeah, so it was that time back in the Civil War when, uh, you know, Confederates stormed the <laughs> the Capitol, and uh, they had a great battle victory there. No, in 2021 is when it happened. So that's where we are. Anyway, there's God, there's so many different things we can talk about on this, but there there there's an angle that I think we need to engage with, and it's this. We're waiting to find out which Republicans might, in theory, sign on to the impeachment attempt. There have been, you know, Kinzinger is one that they're talking about. I've seen one or two others I'm not as familiar with. Cheney might yep. be on board. But like, once you set aside the House, is it going to work in the Senate? Will he be convicted? My guess is hell no. But <laughs> it's possible. And you know one reason it's possible? Because according to the New York Times, Mitch McConnell, still Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, has told associates that he believes President Trump committed impeachable offenses and that he is pleased that Democrats are moving to impeach him, believing that it will make it easier to purge him from the party. And when I imagine him being secretly pleased, I just imagine like the Grinch's face curling into that smile, <laughs> but with a shell. Um, <laughs> but lest before you give him tons of credit for secretly being pleased about this development, uh, the Kentucky Republican has not taken the necessary steps to ensure that a Senate trial takes place before Trump leaves office, leaving open the possibility that the proceedings could be put off um, for months. Absolutely. And uh, so, so what does it mean? Like, like that that story went out. I think it was like late last afternoon or last night, and everyone's like, "Oh my God, is that is that like the wind changing?" Is that the no. script being flipped? Is everything different? Has the game been changed? No. Well, but he's not doing anything though, and he could have. He's the leader of the Republicans in the Senate. So, is that a photo from like 20 years ago? I was just <laughs> thinking that. like that no more. There you go. That's anyway, something like joking. seven years ago. Um, no, so really fast, because you have to look and read closely at politicians' statements, very closely. One word or two words will change the entire thing, and then they'll claim that they never said it because of a a, a, a small change. <clears throat> so this is just a quote that so that they said about what he said. Um, they said he's potentially he's pleased about Democrats moving forward on impeachment because he'd make it easier to purge him from the party, not purge him from the office, not kick him out of the uh, out yeah. of the White House, but to purge him from the party. Let's go back to what I was just saying. Um, about Mike Pence and decided not to move forward with the 25th. They're concerned about the party. They are not concerned about the country. They are not concerned about what else he may do in the last week or so that he has in office. What they're concerned about is how he'll stain the party in the future. Mitch McConnell's not going to be here forever, but that's what he's concerned about: is the stain on the party in the future. Purge him from the party. That doesn't mean in the next seven days. I mean, it's purge him from the party because then after he leaves, he says he's going to run again. He says he's going to have influence on governor races and, and on house races and Senate races. I'm going to destroy anybody. I'm making a list. All that has been happening. But what they're concerned about is him doing all that. So let's purge him from the party so that he yeah. has no party home to go back to. And we're no longer carrying this anchor called Donald Trump. That's what Mitch McConnell is concerned about. That's why Mitch McConnell is happy about this. That's why he's not going to move forward with any kind of Senate procedure to actually finish the job after the House does it. It's because that would get him out of office, not out of the party. Yeah, look, maybe we'll be wrong. Maybe big news Friday, you know, but I doubt Hopefully, it. I doubt it. I, I, um, I love being wrong about stuff like this because then I love be, being wrong. It, I have it'll to be better. defense mechanism because I yeah. always am. But. <laughs> Yeah, I like I just I don't see it. I don't don't see it. No. But wait, late last night, exclusive Axios reporting, McConnell is now a better than even bet to convict Donald Trump in a Senate trial if the House impeaches the president on Wednesday, which it almost assuredly will. And that at so we have all of our analysis that we just gave and now, and now add on to no, that's the same exact thing. That doesn't mean anything <laughs> until he actually does it. What does it mean? A better than even bet. Okay, I went to college with a whole bunch of degenerate sports gamblers, and they do it to this day. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. We if we took a Vegas trip two years ago. They didn't stop with the sports gambling and everything else. So, you know what they you know what they probably lost some money on? A better than even bet. 
that their team was gonna pull this out or that their parlay was gonna was gonna uh, 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 solidify and get them 1500 bucks. Didn't work out that way because sometimes the better than even bets don't pan out. It's weird how that works. It's still gambling and it's still mm-hmm. not a sure thing. In fact, it's more of a sure thing to look at the track record of somebody who's been in office and what they've done. And then uh, the, the lack of follow through they have on actually helping folks out. Yeah. That's Mitch McConnell and that's what we can bet on more than anything else. Yeah, um, well, we'll see. We'll see what Mitch McConnell does. Maybe he'll surprise us for the first time <laughs> ever. I would love for him to but surprise anyway. I would lo- I like surprises. They're fun. <laughs> anyway, um, okay, let, let's turn to another aspect of this. One of the conversations that's been going around, you know, in those who oppose impeachment <laughs> is that this would be a dangerous precedent. We showed you videos yesterday. We could show you tons of speeches from the house floor this morning, but it is exactly the people you'd assume saying exactly the things you'd assume. So we're not gonna waste our time with that. But you should understand that the argument that impeachment would cause greater danger is one that Off the record, at least, some of these representatives are saying not just is a consideration, but is actually influencing their vote, they say. This is a tweet from Anna Cabrera. In the category of shocking but not surprising, CNN's Jamie Gangle reports that the White House is putting huge pressure on members and that members are saying, quote, they want to vote to impeach, but they are legitimately fear for their lives and their families' lives. Then add to that this statement. This is from Lindsey Graham. Supporting the impeachment of President Trump under these circumstances will do great damage to the institutions of government and could further, it could invite further violence at a time the president is calling for calm. So Graham is saying there are terrorists out there who might do something bad if we politically do X, so don't do X. That isn't, that is literally just giving the terrorists what they want. That's saying terrorists don't want us to do this, so let's not do it. And he's at least going on the record and saying that. Even though he opposes it, some are saying they support impeachment, but they won't necessarily vote for it because they're afraid they might be killed. Again, that is terrorists succeeding in their mission. That's where we're at in America right now. And not only that they're allowing it to happen, but they're openly saying it, which encourages more terrorists. That's the that's the reason why back in the Bush days, it was we don't negotiate with terrorists because other terrorists or would be terrorists are gonna go, hmm. So that's how you get them to do what you want them to do. I'll do that. Because I want them to do some things too. It's it's the it's the basis for conservative talk when it comes to anything from law enforcement to to um, to holding people accountable and be like, we have to make sure there's a crime deterrent here. Well, where's the crime deterrent? Suddenly we don't care about deterring crime anymore. And by the way, so um, they're fearful for their lives and their families' lives, which gives uh, some legitimacy to the to the the reality. Of the types of attacks these folks say they want to carry out. Remember when they were complaining about Antifa and BLM protesting outside of people's houses during the summer when they were on the sidewalk, when Ken and Karen in Missouri came out with their guns because they were fearing for their lives? Every time they talked about Antifa and these leftists aggressively and angrily and violently walking up and down our streets, did you would once after that say, we're afraid for our lives from BLM? And Antifa, so let's do what they say. You never said that, did you? You just said, we fear for their lives, so therefore we have to send the National Guard to take them off our streets. Can you believe what they're doing to our country? No, they're so, they're scary. They're they're throwing, they're giving us death threats. And by the way, I believe that they were getting death threats. Death threats happen all the time from all corners of this country because people, for some reason, get their rocks off and threatening to kill someone. Either way, what they didn't do was respond by saying, hey, let's do what they tell us to do. Because number one, I don't think they took their threats that seriously, but they definitely take their supporters' threats seriously because their supporters love to carry out those threats. That's why right wing conservative white supremacist violence has been on the rise in this country for years and they've ignored it because it's real and they know it's real. Yeah, yeah. and and so you have you have that connection where it appears to be working and then also so let, let's talk about incentives for the prospective terrorists well it seems like when we do the bad stuff uh, the republicans give us what they want and also isn't it nice that when we do that bad stuff we have an entire media infrastructure designed to pretend that it wasn't us doing that and even if it was it wasn't that bad Like they get to do this stuff, terrorize people, literally kill people, kill cops, knowing 
that Fox News is gonna defend them, all the online right wingers are gonna defend them. They're gonna pretend that it was Antifa. If, if any of them actually suffer any consequences, it's gonna be described as cancel culture. This environment could not be better set up to encourage acts of domestic terrorism. Not just in terms of making sure that the guns are out there and that the radicalization is out there, but coverage and defense and justification for the terrorists and the knowledge that the right will bow to what the terrorists want. Both in terms of being worried about the attacks, but also sort of preemptively wanting to give those crazies what they want because they know that's literally their base. And if yeah. they speak out against those people, they'll probably lose in a primary. So they're facing either losing their political careers or their literal lives if they don't get, if they don't give these terrorists what they want. That's yeah. where we're at. <sighs> That's where we're at. <sighs> okay, <laughs> let's talk a little bit more about danger. The current state of the Capitol right now. We're gonna show you some photos of the preparations for the inauguration. It's scary stuff. Before we get to that though, I just want to remind you of a few other things floating around about there that are a little bit dangerous. So um, we have these QAnon supporting Congress people, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert and all of that. Marjorie Taylor Greene apparently, according to Representative Jason Crow, they're looking at options within the House uh, to deal with her expulsion, censure, things like that. Because um, since the attack, she has been posting incredibly inflammatory things. Uh, incurring, encouraging more violence. Lauren Boebert, the same exact way, and there's concerns about, you know, possible involvement of not necessarily them, but some on the inside working with those insurgents last week. Reminder, though, and I had actually forgotten about this. You know, you try to hold all of it in your mind, but you forget. Remember the multiple rounds of news of Trump praising QAnon, things like this. The QAnon people, all I know is they love our country and they love Trump. And then people with Q sweatshirts are killing cops in the Capitol. He had that town hall where he was talking about how QAnon, I don't know anything about the bad stuff. I don't know anything about Satan. They just love children and they love our country. I had completely forgotten about that, about months in the lead up to the election of him defending the people who believe the craziest conspiracy theory anyone has ever concocted. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's just the way it, uh. I'm not sure if they didn't know it was going to happen or not, but they had to have. That's the whole point. But they just didn't think it would come back on them. That's the surprise. That's the things that I kept hearing the whole morning when things were going down. It was, man, I didn't think they'd actually do it. And I was like, aren't you too embarrassed to say that, to, to, to utter that sentence? After you foment the violence and, and, and incite the terrorists, then say, yeah, man, I didn't think this would happen. Who could have seen it coming? Maybe I should listen to those snowflake libs that have been telling me for four and a half years who this guy is and what he's looking to do. That he has literally no bottom to his basement of self dealing and in ego, egomaniacal moves. That's all he is. That's all. It's very simple. He's not a complicated person. He really isn't. It's just people are afraid of him for some reason because he talks loud. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of people that talk loud. Yeah. Listen to them. We sometimes do. <laughs> anyway, yeah, the, the QAnon stuff just absolutely crazy, and uh, you know he's saying that as multiple Republicans are running, believing that satanic pedophiles eat children to absorb their life essence. That's literally what they believe. <sighs> but anyway, um, so you have all of that, and those people. There are so many of them, and they're so dangerous, and the danger is so obvious, especially after the Capitol attack. Should have been obvious beforehand, but it's more obvious after that. Now, in the prep for the inauguration, America. The best country ever has to send tens of thousands of troops into the capital to stop violent extremists from taking over our government. So there you're seeing a model of the Statue of Freedom. Scores of US troops deployed to the capital to protect Congress are sleeping on the ground there. There are going to be more than 20,000 in the end. And in the end, I hope that either they're not necessary or because they're there, nothing will happen. But we also just talked yesterday about an FBI report that there is a plan to send tens of thousands of armed terrorists to the Capitol mm -hmm. to potentially kill Democrats and even Republicans. So in the end, I hope that that's enough. I'm assuming that it is, but the Capitol has never before needed to be flooded by soldiers to stop the enraged supporters of the guy who lost again 
trying to stop the new president from being sworn in. And again, JR, I just like we're all for people taking accountability for when they've been wrong. I want you right now to apologize for spending the last few years talking about how Trump is a unique threat. <laughs> We're also, apologize. also want to apologize for all us libs that uh, would riot in the streets, not go to work, um, uh, threaten lawmakers, invade the Capitol, assault police officers once the candidate that we voted for lost. Because you know that's what was going to happen. I heard it from a, a lot of sources over the past few years that you know the you libs aren't like us conservatives. You know if we lose, which we won't, um, then. We'll go back to work and just carry on with our lives because we're true patriots. Now, somehow the patriots are the ones storming the Capitol, upset about their man child losing the election. That's all they're upset about. So, which one is it? Like, I need someone to acknowledge this. Just like they won't acknowledge the violence, just like they won't acknowledge the potential threat, they still won't acknowledge that they've reacted in a way that they said was the most un American thing you could possibly do. Now, somehow it's patriotic. It's almost like they have no principles. It's almost, oh my God, it is almost like that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah, and and we're just hope, like they're they're there a week in advance because we don't know exactly when things are going to happen, and we're gonna, we're going to talk a little bit more about what actually happened during the attack, but but just that this is necessary, and it is necessary. They they should have had thousands there if they'd had a couple of thousand there last Wednesday. You know, a number of people would still be alive. That cop yep. wouldn't have been beaten to death by Trump supporters. If they had been there, um, I'm not sure if you heard about this, John, but um, there's some of these uh, Trump circles, Trump supporter circles are talking about, you know, things are still getting organized or they've been cut off to a certain degree because of all of the social media bans. Uh, but they're saying, uh, okay, you guys, the deep state and the libs are starting to set us up. So if you start seeing these posts about gather here and go to this state capital and go to that, go to our nation's capital, do that, those are traps. Don't fall for it. The deep state is going to come and arrest you. Mm -hmm. Now, if that's the case, it means you're admitting that naturally your rallies are dangerous, they're violent, and somehow you'd get arrested. Because I thought rallies and free speech and chanting and protesting is an American thing we all get to do. Suddenly now, if you just show up to the planned protest, if somehow the libs in the deep state are setting up for you to show up at so they can arrest you on the spot, doesn't that mean that you've committed Crimes, or does that mean that you're going there to commit crimes? It's it's a self admission that your rallies yeah. are dangerous. I don't think you remember BLM folks going, "Hey, you guys, so be careful about which BLM rally you decide to go to because those are probably set up by right wings that are going to come arrest us as soon as we get there." Well, yep. BLM folks came out there to protest, and then they got arrested because of a, a, a frothing at the mouth cops and uh, and other folks that decided to confront them in the middle of their peaceful protest about. Avoiding police murder on a wide scale in the country. That's all. But you know, yeah. In this case, you just I, get arrested. Exactly. You know, no, no, like everything that you just said makes sense. But that, like, how many of the people who would go to that protest are going to work through all of what you just said? It's too complicated. It's for a rational thinking mind. <laughs> um, it's true. It's true. We've been found out. We set up these fake protests for you to go and to be arrested. So don't go. Don't send thousands of people armed to the yeah. Capitol. All our plot has been foiled, and democracy can continue. <laughs> yeah, because by the way, honestly, I'm fine with that. I think I, I think that's the that's the cover for them basically. Because again, you have to have some kind of a conscience and self reflection to go, hey, you guys, we were wrong. Hey, this whole yeah. insurrection thing they thought was a game because we like to play a, a World of Warcraft and we think that we're patriots hey. from. Careful there, buddy. <laughs> we think we're patriots from the Revolutionary War. We think this is 1776. So now you think it's all that, but um, now now that you saw what can go down, and then now the consequences that are coming for just a few of them, now it's someone else's fault that these other things are being planned. I think it's their quiet way of saying, hey, you guys, let's stop. Let's not go to these yeah. rallies we're planning. Let's blame it on someone else, but let's not go to the rallies we're planning. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated 
by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. In the last days of Trump, we're watching to see who is going to turn on him, how quickly and how significantly. Like those corporations that are no longer giving to Republicans, they deserve basically no credit. Um, people like Liz Cheney, we're gonna vote to impeach him. Minor credit, but you've supported a ton of wars, so I don't really care what you think. Um, but what about his best friends in media, like Geraldo Rivera? Geraldo has been his man for a while, and here is what Geraldo had to say. A loyal friend, hounded without mercy by Democrats, intent on destroying him from day Ugh. one. Then he lost the election, it made him crazy, or revealed <laughs> a dysfunction I had refused to see. He then unleashed a mob to make war on their own government. Five to their doom, Liz Cheney is right. That's a, that's a crazy tweet, it's a crazy tweet. <sighs> a loyal friend, you still think he's loyal? Anyway, <laughs> but he said he's now either crazy or it's a dysfunction. I'm gonna jump ahead to the next tweets. Regardless of how Senate ultimately votes, it's entirely appropriate that Donald Trump be impeached by the House he knew what mob intended from the jump. Stop the steel crowd was raucous and seething. Many were armed, all angry. What the hell did POTUS think they were going to do? And then he says that he and his son and Rudy Giuliani were complicit in unleashing snarling, seething, shouting mob that invaded and defaced the Capitol. They must apologize, show contrition for grievous loss of life and pain inflicted. They must reach out to the families of dead and beg forgiveness. Also, hopefully, go to jail. But anyway, uh, JR, Geraldo is saying, like, he is directly responsible, his son is directly responsible. He did this, he should be impeached. He should be impeached, he's directly responsible. He lost the election, he went crazy, he has a dysfunction. I'm going through all of these negative things about him. He yeah. unleashed the mob, um, Liz Cheney is right. Five people to their doom, he says, regardless of how the Senate acts. Um, the mob, he called them, uh, he knew what they intended. Oh man, all the people who helped him with this should apologize, should for, beg for forgiveness. All this from your loyal friend. What play is Ronald pushing here, right? It's his loyal friend, Trump. You know, people lose friends over $50. People lose friends over, I loaned you that $1,000 two years ago and you haven't paid me back. I'm tired of this. People lose friends over, maybe he slept with your girlfriend or your wife. People lose friends over lots of things. How do you not lose your friend over an insurrection that you just said? tried to storm the Capitol and kill people and got five others killed. That's still your buddy? That's still your buddy? Why are we still worried about him being your friend? After of all that he went through, the first thing he said was a loyal friend. Loyal friend. Is he still your friend? Is he still your buddy? I don't know, man, it's just, it's, it seems weird to keep a friend like that the <laughs> whole time. Or maybe he's hoping to continue that friendship because the last I heard from Ronald talking about Trump is Trump ain't talking to him. He's not taking his phone calls because he acknowledged that he lost the election. Is that your buddy? That's your friend? I've had a lot of friends and none of them have done things like this. And then afterwards I go, mm -hmm. yeah, you know what? Let's meet up for lunch uh, uh, next week, Greg. I, I love how you tried to break into my house and destroy everything in it, but let's hang out a little yep. longer. No, possibly that doesn't happen with it. your friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're describing him as loyal. Like there's there's almost nothing that he's less. He's more swole than he is loyal. Like like that's the thing he is least. He is bottomed out on that stat. He ain't loyal to anything. Maybe Ivanka, but for all the wrong reasons. And that's it, really. Not for anyone else. He's like playing the long game, if you know what I mean with her. But anyway, no, not loyal. So look, does it? At the end of the day, this is a weird aside, 
for Geraldo, nobody cares really. Like even amongst the right, Geraldo is sort of an edge figure, like because he doesn't, he will sometimes disagree with them. He'll sometimes disagree with Trump even a little bit. He has done that, um, but he's definitely moving on. I would say that this is probably looking ahead, probably looking ahead to what's coming. You know, like if he thinks that Trump is going to be out, he wants to be able to say that he was on the right side of this. Maybe it's genuine. Geraldo. More so than almost all of the people on Fox News seems like a person that is wrong a ton. But like JR, let me know if you disagree. But seems like he's being genuine, Geraldo. Like whether this, he's, no, no, I don't mean specifically now. But mm-hmm. when he takes a position, it feels more often like he's being genuine than, like if Jesse Waters says something, it doesn't mean anything. Like, you know, if Kilmeade says something, God only knows what it means. With with Geraldo, it kind of feels like he's being genuine a lot of the time. I feel like wrong, he's wrong, but genuine. more when he speaks than when he tweets. But it could be all the same because the the one thing you can say about I think I don't know Geraldo. The one thing I think you can assume about Geraldo is he's being honest because he says things that you probably don't you would advise against him saying um, on platforms where he's gonna get pushed back. Then he flips and does the opposite. It's almost like he can't keep up with his own process because he'll dog out these folks and then next week talk about how awesome they are. And oh, in reality, they were pushed to this point. Well, at this point, you're one of the people who pushed him to the point because you're criticizing him too. You can't criticize the critics and then be one. It doesn't work yeah. out that way. But you're trying to play all the sides. So I feel like it's like 10% strategy and 90% just shooting from the hip, which I'm not sure how much you can commend him for it. I guess you can commit him to a point for 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 not towing the line all the time. Yeah. But okay, well, <laughs> um, so we're, we're gonna have to see with Geraldo. Uh, let's turn now to uh, the most loyal show to Trump on a daily basis that, that people care about. Like anyway, is probably Fox and Friends, I would imagine. They're like super important because they get so many views and Trump does whatever they say. Well, <laughs> looking ahead to the future of Fox and Friends, we have this video where you're gonna see uh, Ducey and Kilmeade disagreeing about both what happened last Wednesday, how significant it was, what you can compare it to and how much culpability Donald Trump has. Let's take a look at that. Because Brian, you're talking about people who work in the Congress. And we're talking about the Congress was under attack last week. It was looted. There was a riot. So was Portland every day, and nobody this, cared on the left. Brian, those people would, have lives too, just because they don't have medallions to go through metal detectors every day. All the state houses and Brian, the police houses that were ransacked, and nobody cared. I don't think what they were doing in Portland was trying to overthrow the police democracy. stations, the democracy well, of if the they United could, they States would. of America, Brian. I get it, and there is some equivalency when you look at the fact that they were both attacks and they're both protests. Right, right. But this this was uh, essentially, and some people have used uh, the people on the political left say the president incited this. The president is the one who said, "Come to Washington, let's have this big thing. It's going to be wild," and it was wild. Mitch McConnell and also Kevin McCarthy are trying to figure out how to punish him because they say he has gone too far. Right, right. Well, as we went over. So, JR, again, um, you have to wonder, is this just you know, trying to, is Ducey just trying to set himself up to be you know, back in the good Republicans again afterward? Like, is this, is this them seeing what's been going on the last week? And everybody, everybody is trying to figure out what is the GOP going forward? What is Trump's role? How powerful will it be? How long will it last? Is this an indication that Steve Ducey thinks that Trump is has made bad decisions and is not going to be that significant? Because that that was about as opposed to Trump's interests as I have seen from a Ducey quote. Yeah, he has his moments here and there, and they've been coming more and more lately. Definitely not earlier on in the administration, or a lot early on in his term, not at all. Because again, there's a gauge. I think I like it's similar to Geraldo. He has this this reality. A signal in his head every once in a while, and it goes off, and he goes, "But wait a second, that doesn't make sense." Because Ducey, once he reads all this and and looks into it, and he's surrounded by this bubble, and maybe it's not just Ducey; it's people in general. When you, that's why bubbles sometimes are dangerous. You're just in your bubble, and all you hear is the talk within the bubble, and it's all the same thing. And every once in a while, your brain might go, "Wait, that doesn't make sense." But everyone is saying that, Mm -hmm. so maybe it does make sense. Everyone is just his bubble. So every once in a while, there's this a light goes off, and he's like, "But 
But wait a second, President Trump came and said it's gonna be wild. President Trump came and said, let's march down Pennsylvania Avenue. President Trump said, let's go tell them how to really take over our country. President Trump told them, let's fight. We have to fight or we lose it. All that, and if he couldn't, he couldn't separate the fact it was Trump versus whether or not Obama had done that and how it would have been an easy, easy declaration to say he incited a riot. He tried an insurrection, they tried to stage a coup on the country. You can say that when you disagree with the person, it's harder to come to that, as Geraldo said, when it's a loyal friend that's doing it. That's mm-hmm. the problem, and they come into grips with the fact that their loyal friend is not their loyal friend. Yeah, yeah, I. Uh, it's interesting because like we were, we were talking on the show yesterday when Jordan was on about how like Tucker Carlson is now going to be more in charge of the news side. They're replacing one hour of their news programming in the evening with more opinion. And so all of that seems to be moving in the direction of let's just say more crazy stuff and appeal to the crazies to fight back against OAN and Newsmax. Geraldo and Ducey seem to be moving in the opposite direction. I don't know, is it different? Is it making different bets on what the future looks like? Are they theoretically not going to last a long time in the in Fox, the direction that it's moving? Mm-hmm. It seems crazy to think that Ducey might run afoul of the Fox audience, but my guess know. is that Fox, there's there's less, I don't know. I have absolutely no reason to know this. I feel like there's fewer marching orders or fewer uh, parameters of things they're supposed to say or not say. Because we've seen those documentaries back in the day or things about the memos that go around in Fox and have this standard mm-hmm. line. Of political approach you're supposed to have for all these stories. I feel like they lightened up on that a bit, but then they still got the people who think that way many times on these shows. And then now they're confronted with this freedom with being able to say what they think. But then when they say it, they hear it coming from their mouths and like, but that's not what I think. Cuz yeah. everyone around me doesn't think that way. And it's confusing. Yeah, yeah. well, um, as important as Geraldo, and do CR. Let's turn to some people who are slightly more important and uh, cue up something a little bit difficult. Yesterday on Instagram Live, Representative Alexandria Ocasio Cortez was talking about the experience of last Wednesday. I want to go to a little bit of that video. I can tell you that I had a very close encounter where I thought I was going to die. Um, and you have all of those thoughts um, where, you know, at the end of your life, and all of these thoughts come rushing to you. And um, that's what happened to a lot of us on Wednesday. I thought I, I I did not think, I did not know if I was going to make it to the end of that day alive. Um, and not just in a general sense, but also in a very, very specific sense. And I think what's really important is that, you know, because whenever any person, um, has an encounter where they think they're going to die and they go through that process, um, that is that is a traumatizing event. And you don't have to, things don't have to get that far for something to be traumatizing. So um, she didn't give uh, much more specifics about what happened, you know, for fairly obvious reasons, but um, yeah, you, you, you feel it. And what she's saying there, that experience about being afraid that as they were being moved through the building, they could be killed. That when they were hunkered down in that room, you know, they're in the room and they're in the room with some new representatives who are way more philosophically affiliated with the attackers than with their colleagues that have been there for three days. And like she's worried about being killed by the people rampaging through the hallways. She's in a room. With a new representative who posed in ads with an assault rifle and AOC, even though she's from thousands of miles away, and the way that the way that the right for now two years has demonized AOC, have focused so much of their attention on her to <clears throat> place her at the center of every one of their grievances against government, that many of them also, let's just be clear, have sexualized her in the way that they've talked about her, the things they've tried to make into scandals. Like I, I I cannot imagine how afraid she must have been. And also Representative Ilhan Omar, who they've focused on an incredible amount too mm-hmm. in trying to drive hatred towards them. Like what do you, like we talked about this earlier. What do you think those people storming the halls think about AOC and Representative Omar and what <laughs> they would do if they could have then? And it's, so many people on the right bear so much responsibility for the way that they've talked about those two. 
Yeah, there's a bit of an obsession going on. You know, the way the way that there's a lot of fanfare for AOC and Ilan Omar's and Rashida Talib's of the world, Ayanna Presley's and everyone. So the way that there's that positive response, because people are like, you know, she I think also on that day, maybe the next day, tweeted, I'm okay, everyone. And the amount of first off support it generated and also anger that she even tweeted that is the first thing I think about. So we know she's a fiery person. We know that she's opinionated. We know that she'll speak out and she kind of doesn't have much fear for any of this happening. We remember the encounter she had with, I think it was Congressman Yoho. Yes, um, on the steps. On yeah. the steps, right? Where he virtually threatened her there too, right? So I don't think it's new to her, but it hadn't been in her face like that. And which made me, I don't know, maybe it's an unpopular opinion, but I don't want her talking about it. I gotta be honest, I don't want her saying, they almost got to me or there was this moment. Cuz that feeds, like you mentioned, they have this, the folks who hate her have this, first off, opposition to her, her political stances and her agenda and what she wants to do for the country. But then they also, but they 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 go to these weird tangents, like you said, sexually and, and, and her what she looks like and what they wanna do to her, all that stuff happens. And this almost feeds that, I don't know, whatever it is in them, that feel satisfaction Obsession, from hearing mania. about that. Yeah, and then so they want to hear about how she almost was killed or oh, it was on the verge of that, oh, she was really scared. That helps them just into themselves. I don't want them any kind of comfort or happiness or appreciation for anything that was pulled off or tried to get pulled off on that day. And I want her to be able to tell her story. I just don't want it to end up with more negative repercussions because then more fantasies are bred from that. Yeah, I mean, look, she's obviously always been much very open, especially like that was on Instagram. On Instagram, she talks very openly about the day to day work of doing it. And I and I think that that provides a real service. Um, she she needs to have security all the time, everywhere she goes. Like for yes, for the inauguration and also all the time. Because these people are insane and they're only getting more insane. And and I, I'm gonna go and, and, and gauge a guess that a, a, large number of people don't believe her story, think that she's out there sensationalizing it, think she's telling yep. everybody that she was in danger because she wants to get some attention. All that I'm sure is being said, I haven't looked at any of it. Um, but that's what that's the kind of responses you'll get. And then they'll go, I'll, 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 I'll go show her, I'll show her what real danger is. Like things like that, I don't want to be building. That's really my concern yeah. on this stuff. Yeah, I saw some tweets um, attacking her. Like, I I don't even know if I, I like. They're they these are people that I I find so reprehensible. I don't even want to mention their names. These disgusting people who are attacking her after that comment, um, knowing knowing exactly what the right thinks mm -hmm. about her and wants to do to her. So let let's move on um, to let's see. We have more uh, scary information about what was going on. Uh, Representative Val Demings confirmed to CNN that she believes there was some inside assistance for the Capitol rioters. Now, this there's uh, multiple different forms of this that are now being discussed that we're gonna that are gonna be investigated. Uh, there is a video going around of uh, a group of these people in the Capitol in a room on the day of the attack, uh, talking about floor plans and pressing the assault and stuff like that. I don't know exactly what that means. There's also discussion about one of these representatives taking them on like a tour through the building in the days before, potentially like giving them the idea of the layout for when they go in. I saw that the one of the the guy who brought the Molotov cocktails, he apparently mm -hmm. had some document where he had scrawled names of people that that were bad, and he also had phone numbers for Ted Cruz's office. I don't know exactly what that means. Um, let's see, I believe it was, was it Ayanna Presley who talked about the fact that she, her chief of staff found out that uh, the, all the panic buttons in their office had been removed <laughs> in advance, maybe just as a remodel, but they weren't told about it, which seems weird. There's just a lot of stuff that is incredibly concerning um, about all of the, the, the prep for this, what happened during it. Some of the social media activity of like new representative Lauren Boebert, who seemed to be trying to make sure that the attackers knew where Speaker Pelosi was at the time. Yeah, Boebert was explicitly told, well, not her. All of them were explicitly told not to tweet, 
not to go on social media because they could give up your location. And she went on specifically to do just that. So it's, there wasn't a misconception, there wasn't a, 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 a forgetfulness, or even just a, I wanna tell my constituents I'm okay, so let me make sure I tweet this out. No, none of that was, was the basis for any of these, uh, these posts that, that Bobert had. It was to do exactly what they told them not to do. I mean, what what other, what other explanation is there? And if there is, tell us. That's fine. And by the way, all these things that, that you know, the potential, the tours that were given, the uh, Ayanna Presley's office with the panic button, investigate this stuff. Hey, if you don't believe it, fine, let's investigate it. I'm willing to wait for that investigation. And maybe it was on the day when the panic, like as you mentioned, maybe the panic buttons were normally being switched out or something. But someone had to have known that there's a. Why would you do that on this day? <laughs> more, more of the things that you're worried about when it comes to knowing what's coming upcoming from this attack. And then the lack of preparation or the wide open doors that were that were welcomed them in. And we also know there was some of these folks that were capital people that had badges and, and, and had access were waltzing in, flashing their badges, walking folks in. All this needs to be explained. So if we wanna do the whole way conservatives do whenever something goes wrong, when their supporters do, wait and see. Let's wait and see, but let's do something to see what we're gonna see. Uh, let's not wait and see and then do nothing. What are we looking to see? Let's investigate this and see what happened. It has to, it has to, it has to be cleared up because there's way too much unrest and way too many people that don't believe in the security of our country anymore. Yeah, and some of them have been elected. So you know, yeah. AOC talked about not wanting to be in the room with some of those new representatives who believe the QAnon stuff. The same as those insane people rampaging through the hallways. They believe that Satan is talking to the Democrats and the Democrats are. Putting on babies, torn off faces. Yep. These people are voting on impeachment today. Anyway, Ayanna Presley was very concerned about being there, and now they've installed. I think we're going to talk about on the main show. They've installed those metal detectors, and mm-hmm. they've been up for one day. And yeah, they're not. The representatives aren't. They're not feeling bound by that. They're just going around and running through it and not stopping. And apparently, they're allowed to do that somehow. I forget if it was Bobert or if it was Marjorie Taylor Greene wouldn't allow their bag to be searched. Yeah, I don't trust this person with any kind of weapon in the area. Madison Cawthorn, by the way, the new representative said he was armed on that day. Mm. We have no we have no knowledge about whether he can legally even carry a gun in D.C., but he says he was armed. Would you want to be alone in a room on that particular day when those fascists are st- storming through the Capitol? No, not no. Every single one of them should be searched as they go in. I forget exactly who some one of the new representatives. It might have been a member of the squad said, like if you show up to work at McDonald's without your uniform, <laughs> you don't get to work. That's a part of the job. And these people seem to forget that yes, they have fancy titles, but they're employed by us to do a specific job. Okay, and if and they go from like thanking the police for protecting them to like a few hours later tweeting, how dare they ask us to go through these sorts of things. Well, that's what the cops, remember those cops that are heroes that that were protecting you? They say this is necessary and you're not gonna comply with it. Louis Gomer thinks he's too good for that. Don't break through that thin blue line. Yeah, many of them, they were breaking through it, their alarms went off, they sidestepped it, they shoved through, shoved a a female cop, one particular representative or Mm -hmm. senator, shoved a, a female cop out of the way so he can walk through, I have a job to do. Look at these lines, the the pompous like <laughs> privilege that they assume they deserve for nothing is astounding. But and they'll, it'll be on full display. They'll tweet about it. It's not like they want to hide the way that they're acting over this. They think that they're on the right side of this. And by the way, welcome to the rest of America. Welcome to to public schools that have to deal with this type of stuff because you guys want to throw out thoughts and prayers for gun violence in the country when it doesn't affect you and then metal detectors yeah. go up and then schools look like prisons. Now it's not, not it's a problem now when, oh my God, the Capitol has metal detectors. Can you believe that? You know who I am? You're another person who was in a place that was invaded one week ago with armed violent insurgents. That's where you yep. are. I'm so tired of this. I want to play a little bit more of Representative Ocasio-Cortez's remarks because obviously she's shaken a lot of people both in and out of office are shaken by what happened on Wednesday and the state of what millions of our fellow Americans are like. But that does not mean that she is backing down, which I think will be very clear from this video. 
a reminder that the Confederacy was not part of the United States, was never part of the United States, will never be a part of the United States. They are traitors to democracy, they are enemies of a multiracial democracy, and they will never have glory in our, in our history, in our present, or in our future, period. <laughs> And it, that shouldn't be necessary. And yet, you have Confederate flags being carried into the Capitol. You have so many Americans, some in elected office, who like think back wistfully on those days, um, so like philosophically more connected with this group that tried to destroy America um, than America itself. Happy to see the Confederate flag. They're posing for photos with it, defending it still to this day. And believing that that that's that that's the better path, and the same sort of philosophy that went into the, the Confederacy and that attempt to destroy America is driving a lot of what's going on right now. These are anti-democratic forces that have no like, yeah, in the past they love the American flag, they don't care at all about America, its values, its people, its constitution, any of that. Um, so thank God we do have good representatives like AOC. Although I have to say, really fast, um, there was a. Like we 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 speculate every once in a while, including me, about like what her future path will be like. Um, she said in an interview in the last year, she doesn't know if she is planning for a life in politics because, mm -hmm. in no small part, the way it's conducted, how dangerous it is, the personal uh, threats against her, and like obviously she has to protect herself. I the last thing I want is for her or any other member of the squad to back off from politics because we need them, but. This is a place where she must seriously worry about those insane people wherever she goes. It's got to be at front of her mind, and so it's a very scary time, a very yeah. scary time. It's and this, things like that. It's the way that she talks that has people so upset. Tell me one thing she lied about there. You know, what did she know. say about the Confederate flag? That's a lie. Was it ever part of the United States? Will it ever be a part of the United States? Should it be flown in the Capitol building? All those things are true that she said. So there's no disputing what she says. People have an issue that she says it. Politicians don't like to say these things because they're worried about alienating people. But they don't realize that the majority of the country thinks that way. But we haven't found much representation that says it. So if the majority of Americans had any kind of these roles in office, they might say similar things. That's the reason why she's so popular because she says what so many people are thinking and wish that their elected representatives would say and do in their name because that's what they're there for. Yeah. So that's why the arguments against her turn into death threats and how dare you and oh my God, I'm gonna. Do this and do that to you just because you said something and is and are trying to push policy that will help us. That's the issue. Nothing with what she says that's incendiary or hateful or or, or anti-American. You just label it that way, just so you can make sure you yeah. demonize the person that's trying to do something right. Yep. Yeah, it's nice to have this group of politicians that's philosophically aligned with us, who we don't have to worry about murdering their colleagues someday. The right, the right got their new group. They got the Boberts and the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Madison Cawthorns, and all that. Can you imagine um, this if is Adam the crazy Schiff, stuff they think about it? Did Adam Schiff, one of the one of the top hated people of Democratic side from Republicans in this cycle, or in this latest presidential term, if he said, "Yeah, I showed up at the Capitol with my Glock," you guys didn't know, but I had it that day. Oh, would they be comfortable with that? With with who they call a pencil neck with, that. with a with a gun? Yeah, no one should. But we're supposed to be comfortable with Madison. I'm Cal. Well, I'm sorry, I forget his last name. Caldwell. Cawthorn. I apologize. I'm, I'm not trying to mess up his name. Showing up with a gun and 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 bragging about it, and talking about how he's got a gun in the Capitol. Should someone else say that? What if AOC said it? I have a gun in the Capitol because people keep threatening my life. Would you be like, that's great, AOC? Start shooting. No, you wouldn't say that either. But suddenly we're supposed to be comfortable with with Madison holding a gun in the Capitol. Yeah. Hope he's lying. Hope he's lying and he probably is because he knows that he can raise money off of it. And it doesn't matter that he's lying, they will never find out. And if they did, they wouldn't care. That's the way it works. Uh, we have an update in the Flint water scandal. I did not expect that we would have that because it's been a while and very little has actually been done. But the former Michigan governor Rick Snyder, as well as other officials, are apparently being investigated and facing charges. Snyder, former health director Nick Leon, and other former officials are expected to face charges, although specifics have not yet been announced. Since 2014, at least 15 current or former state and city officials and staff have been indicted in connection to the water crisis, although the charges have not always gone very far in those. 
Now, it's been a bit since it, and in case you don't remember or you live outside of the country and aren't familiar with it, this water crisis began back in 2014 when the city of Flint, Michigan switched its water source from treated water from Detroit to the Flint River in an effort to save money. The city failed to treat the water properly, allowing massive amounts of lead from old pipes to be pumped directly into Flint homes. Snyder only declared a state of emergency in January of 2016, so two years later, after federal officials announced their own investigation. So it was a very long time. There was a lot of concern already. I mean, you, one of the, the, the noteworthy parts of this that I can never get past is that the GM plant switched to a different township for water because the water that was being sent from the Flint River was corroding engines. So Jesus. it was too, it was rough on the engines, but it was still being given to people. And local officials, state officials, just sort of went along for as long as possible because they were saving money. And at the end of the day, they didn't care what happened to the people of Flint. Yes, and that's where it all starts and ends, honestly. So uh, this representative government where we're supposed to represent the people in that area starts off by saying, let's cut some corners and save some money. Okay, you can save some money, you can have some plans for that. But in order to do that, you have to flesh the whole thing out, save some money, maybe get some from a closer water source. I'm not sure about the uh, the geographical dynamics of this, but maybe it's a closer water source. You got plenty of water, let's go ahead and use it. But if you just cut corners inside just to pump water through the same old rusty pipes, because you don't care about the people that are getting that water, it leads you to a new problem. Now you have this problem in your hands where people are poisoned and dying and can't literally can't use the water in their homes. So what do you do instead if you make this mistake? You don't say, oh, we made a mistake, we overlooked something, and maybe you know what it might do? It might get you kicked out of office, someone probably not gonna vote for you the next time, so you cover your tracks. It's like, let's act like this never happened because you know what? The people that it happened to, they don't matter. They don't have any money, they can't sue us. And if they do start making a, a, a ruckus over this, we can just say they're crazy uh, minorities from Flint. Who cares? Flint. Mm -hmm. No one cares about Flint. So, and that worked up those six years ago. This is the process for elected officials. People that voted them in as the governor of the state literally don't care about their lives because they don't have enough money to force them to care about their lives. And after you mess one thing up, you don't go to fix it like a responsible adult will, the way we teach our children to. Instead, yeah. you cover it up. So if your kid gets into trouble at school or does something wrong and somehow gets busted for it, do you think when you get the letter from the principal, do you then go, okay, okay, Jim, we're gonna cover this up. Is that what you teach your kid at 10, 11 years old? We're gonna cover this up, make sure that you don't yeah. have to face any of these things, make sure you don't have to learn anything, make sure you don't not do this again. No, we don't teach our kids that, but for some reason, we allow our politicians to do it. And now they're up on charges for it, potentially up on charges and investigation for it. We're supposed to feel sorry for him? Really? This has been happening for so long, we're not even talking about it anymore, but it's still a thing. It's still a thing. And every once in a while, you'll see someone from Michigan say, uh, the people of Flint still, have, still don't have clean water. And you go, wow, and you move on again. Yep. <laughs> That's why they yeah. did it this yeah. way. It's been it's been six years. They're still replacing lines, by the way. So supposedly, according to the mayor, um, the replacement of household water service lines is nearly complete. Of these 26,750 that have been ex excavated, fewer than 500 are left to be checked. Um, but I've also read that a lot of people, it's being described as like water post-traumatic stress disorder. Like there are people in the community that even after the lines have been replaced, they still buy bottled water because they are terrified of what could still be in there. And they don't trust the statements from the government because the government lied to them the first time about it. And by the way, there's been this settlement, there's a preliminary back in August of last year, preliminary $600 million settlement for families affected by it, which is helpful. But the effect of lead on your health and especially the development of children doesn't go away after a legal or monetary settlement. That is a lifelong thing that can affect totally. brain development, so like social disorders and, and all sorts of things. These are lifelong effects of a city and a state that tried to save a little bit of money and didn't care enough to, to see whether it was safe or actually let the people there know that it wasn't in the end. And then after people are sick from this, again, these same Americans, they're denied healthcare coverage, they're denied affordable ways of getting that. And then if other things affect them and then they have their life in the dumps over this, we just shove them to the side and tell them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and how come they don't go out and get a job and make themselves better. They live in a society, the society has failed them. What they're doing their part, how about you do your part? 
it's always thrown on the, the, the most vulnerable and the, the least powerful of our society to do something about the situation that they were put in by the most powerful people. What are they supposed to do? What exactly are they supposed to do? Yep. Die. That's what they want them to do. Okay, JR, ending on a bit of a down note. But to be fair, most of the show was one, so <laughs> it was consistent. But I appreciate you joining us. Um, next Wednesday, JR isn't going to be here, but JR, you are going to be on on Tuesday or Thursday? I thought it was Thursday, Thursday but it hasn't been fully decided. Think Thursday. Thursday. I've, I've, I'm seeing from Sophie that it's Thursday, but we'll probably eliminate yeah. that creative part of it. And she didn't say that. It was uh, like, no, it was true. Skip, Which means. <laughs> now, JR, that means that you don't get to do the coverage of the inauguration, but it means you are going to be on the first episode of the first full day of the Biden administration. Oh, That's big exciting. News Thursday, big news Thursday. Big bro. news Thursdays for one Thursday. Anyway, uh, thank you as always. Hopefully, I'm we happy. will not need the popcorn next week because uh, that apparently leads to bad things. So. That's Good. true. Actually, maybe I'll we should be, be careful. <laughs> okay. Thank you, man. Thanks to you guys. See you later. Literally, as we're recording this, Donald Trump's second impeachment process is underway. By the time you're seeing it, it will have concluded. And with Trump being impeached once again and an uncertain future for the process in the Senate, although I have my suspicions, the question remains, what happens to the GP, GOP going forward? And joining us to discuss is columnist for the nation, Sasha Abramsky. Welcome to the Damage Report. Hey, good to be here. Good to have you here. Uh, you recently wrote an article, um, the GOP is no longer a viable governing party, which uh, when I saw it, I thought, uh, my first thought was yes. And my second thought was, I feel like that's been true for a while. Um, but I am curious about your thoughts about the GOP going forward as we transition out of Trump being their official elected leader. I'm curious what you think his role in the party will be. Yeah, look, I, I think that the GOP has had this slide towards extremism that massively predates Trump. You can take it back, certainly at least as far as Newt Gingrich in the early 1990s. Um, but there has been a sort of operating idea that the more you rhetorically throw bombs, the better your political chances. And so the Republican Party reinvented itself over a sort of decades long process. Instead of being a sort of calm and steady party, it became a party of insults, a party of hyperbole, a party of um, sort of increasing extremes. and. Trump sort of is the logical endpoint of that. Because what you see in Trump is the bringing together. You have the business interests who've always liked the Republicans because they like tax cuts and deregulation. But then you have the increasingly extreme fringe, the QAnon people, the people who um, you know, advocate militias, the people who believe that you know, any and every kind of gun control is sort of one world communism. And Trump brings all of that together. And increasingly, you've had this sort of coalition that makes no sense. So a party that includes Mitt Romney, who I don't agree with, but he's a perfectly credible, serious politician. And then a party that includes Donald Trump. And now a party that includes that man in antlers and tattoos who rampaged <laughs> through the Capitol. So mm -hmm. how on earth does that party make sense anymore? And if you look at what's happening in the impeachment debate, which I was watching before coming onto this show, you're seeing one Republican after another basically kissing the ring. They're saying, yeah, you know, yeah, maybe there was an insurrection, maybe there was some treason going on, but um, you're rushing to judgment in any way. We don't like Black Lives Matter. I mean, the sort of ability to deflect is quite extraordinary. Um, and so that's why I wrote this article. You know, does the GOP have has a future as a governing party? Because it seems to me it doesn't. It seems to me it's fragmenting before our eyes into this politics of overt extremism, sort of flirtation with fascism. And that doesn't leave moderates in the party mm -hmm. anywhere ago to go apart from out. Okay, uh, there's a lot of lot of things I want to talk yeah, about so off of that. The, the first though, I, I apologize for sort of going on there. No, no, that, there's just so much there. Um, so uh, you're right, they're kissing the ring. I guess I, I want your opinion. For what exact reason? So are they kissing the ring because they genuinely agree and believe? Are they kissing the ring because they think Trump? Um, supporting a particular politician going forward will be important and they want to be that one? Are they kissing the ring because they think Trump himself will be running again and they want to keep in his good graces when he becomes president again in four years? Um, why do you think they're, they're showing so much loyalty to him even after the attack in the Capitol? I think a few things, one of them is fear that Trump is very good as we've seen at whipping up a mob and that mob is scary. 
So the first thing is that, you know, there are a lot of politicians who looked at what happened to Lindsey Graham, for example, in the airport the other day when he was mobbed by Trump supporters. And they just don't want to go down that road. And they're sort of trying to personally duck and cover. Um, the other thing is, and I don't know how else to say this, but if you look at the parade of GOP speakers in the House today, a lot of these guys are really, really stupid human beings. And I think they don't recognize the magnitude of the moment. I don't think they have any ability to understand the sort of deep philosophy that underpins democracy. These guys basically went into politics as a smash and grab operation. It was good for them, it gave them a little bit of influence, a little bit of power. Perhaps they could give their cronies a little bit of influence and power. But these aren't political philosophers or scholars, and they just are not intellectually up to the magnitude of the moment. And I think, you know, when the history books are written, we'll see that there was this slide toward mediocrity and this sort of degradation of our civics process in the 1990s and early 2000s. And this is the culminating endpoint. So you have people like Matt mm -hmm. Gates, who, you know, Matt Gates shouldn't be in charge of a dog catcher's office, let alone hold a senior role in Congress. The man is a vile human being. He's really, really inflammatory. He's also a really stupid human being. And when you watch people like that sort of try and give cover to Donald Trump, I think it shows you, you know, exactly what kind of moral crisis this country's in. Mm -hmm. That even when the president promotes insurrection, a large number of his followers actually don't understand fully what's going on. Well, I agree. The side of mediocrity, there are people being elected that I can't conceive of succeeding 10 years ago. Um, but I want to tie it back to something that you said earlier, because you said, you know, we can talk about, we can trace the beginnings of this movement towards Trump, but you also labeled Trump as the natural endpoint. But I guess my question is, is he actually the end point or is he just another step along the way? Like, hypothetically, would a president, you know, there, there's different groups of Crazies and those who are mediocre, like if, you know, hypothetically, Madison Cawthorn or Lauren Boebert or Marjorie Taylor Greene, like these people who believe in satanic pedophiles drinking the blood of children, if they were to become president or a slightly different group, the, the Ted Cruz's and the Josh Hollies, who have also been in lockstep with the president during all of this, um, are they actually, are they not worse in your mind, hypothetically, than Trump himself? Yeah, I mean, look, Trump is awful. But you look at the trajectory that parts of the Republican Party are on or the more extreme groups outside the Republican Party. And clearly there are people even more fanatical than Donald Trump. There, there, there are clearly people born and raised now in the culture of QAnon. And there are clearly people who have no fealty to democracy at all. Um, you know, not, not all of them, but certainly some when you were listening to some of the GOP Congress members, they don't care about democracy, they care about raw political power. Um, so yes, Trump could just be a sort of staging post on the way to a complete collapse of our civic systems. Um, but I guess what I'm saying when I say is the logical endpoint. He 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 is the logical endpoint if our country is to remain a democracy. You can't mm -hmm. get more extreme than Donald Trump within the democratic context. And you know, you look at what Trump's doing. You look at who he's flirting with. You look at the neo-Nazi groups that he's siding with. You look at the sort of Aryan nation, all these supremacist groups that now see themselves as part of the Trump coalition. And Trump called them the other day special people. He said, "We love you." You know, he went out of his way to make it abundantly clear that they were the core of his political base. So. Yes, it's entirely possible politics gets even uglier. It's entirely possible that Trump, when he's booted out of office and probably convicted, and you know, my guess is he'll never be allowed to run for public office again, he'll reinvent himself as a far right sort of icon. Um, he'll, he'll reinvent himself on the fringes of the internet. And he was trying to do so today and apparently was discouraged by Kushner. But he's going to reinvent himself on web platforms that are so extreme and so fanatical that they don't in any way, shape or form accept or abide by the democratic norms. But Will the Republican Party go down that road? I don't think so. I think this is Mitch McConnell, you know, for all his other faults. The one thing Mitch McConnell is good at is he's ruthless. He knows how to get rid of somebody when he wants to get rid of somebody. Mm. Trump is of no use to McConnell anymore. And I think McConnell is going to do everything he can to rally the center of the Republican Party away from Trumpism towards something else. It may not be something particularly pleasant, but I think Trumpism as a mainstream, main party ideology probably played itself out in these this sort of horrific actions of the last few days. Um, I, I don't see how the Republican Party leadership in the Senate, the House is a different story, but in the Senate, I don't see how they can stick with Trump or why they would want to stick with Trump after what happened.
Interesting. And now for the others who have been, you know, there have been calls for expulsions and censures of both people in the Senate, like Cruz and Hawley. Um, and now you have concerns about the possibility that some of the new elected representatives in the House might have been live tweeting the location of the speaker or might be philosophically aligned with those who attacked and certainly seem to be at least as much as Trump inspiring the activity that happened on Wednesday. Do you think that it's likely that there will be any consequences against those senators and representatives? I do. I mean, I, I, I think the ringleaders, if it turns out, and you know, I, I don't know, privy to Justice Department investigations, but if it turns out that there were a series of senior politicians who were coordinating with people who ended up invading and brutalizing the Capitol, that is going to have huge political ramifications because the political middle in America has no patience for this. If you look at the numbers, there is no opinion polling that shows a majority of Americans support what happened last Wednesday. They don't, the vast majority of Americans are truly horrified by what unfolded. So if it turns out that you can actually directly link some of these conspirators to people inside Congress, there's gonna be tremendous pressure to censor them at the very least, censure them. But probably there's gonna be pressure to remove some of the more extreme elements from Congress. So. Hawley is a case in point. I mean, look, there's that infamous photo of Hawley going to the protesters shortly before they marched to the Capitol and raising his fist in solidarity with them. After the end point, after the Congress returned into the wreckage, Hawley still raised illegitimate objections to a Democratic election result. Um, yeah. There's certainly allegations that several members of Congress coordinated with, even gave advanced tours of background areas of Congress to these fanatics who would then invade Congress and use their knowledge of where different offices were to try and find people to hunt them down. Um, you know, again, I don't think there's going to be a wholesale expulsion of dozens and dozens of people, but it's certainly possible that you will see a few people in the House and the Senate where the rest of their colleagues take action against them when the truth comes out as to how they behaved and how they acted. It'll be very interesting to see. And also interesting to see, you know, it, it's one thing for Republican leadership to try to move on from Trump. But the people who are so much like Trump in some ways, they're now in elected office as well. And others are trying to pattern themselves after him. It'll be interesting to see if, if those consequences do come. Um, in any event, uh, for those watching this, there are two of Sasha's articles that I want you to go take a look at, and both are available at The Nation. Uh, we have the GOP is no longer a viable governing party, and we need a reckoning with Trump's enablers. Sasha Abramsky, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. My pleasure, thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.